Welcome back. Howie Vickers takes us through the 60s with the collectors. But first, Olympic gold medalist Nancy Green Rain talks about family and fame. Fierce determination and guts, they're part of what makes a champion. Nancy Green Rain's biggest triumph was winning both a silver and a gold medal at the 1968 Olympics in Grenoble, France. On her return to Vancouver, the entire city closed down to welcome her home. The following year, she quit competitive skiing, married ski coach Al Rain, and gave birth to twin boys. I asked why, growing up in a home full of competitive skiers, she was the one who became the champion. I don't know. I've often wondered that myself because certainly we all had equal opportunity. And um, I guess when you look at your own children, you start to realize that everybody's different and you come into the world with, with different talents and, and different, uh, different personalities. Um, you know, my father was involved in building the ski hill in Rossland, and so skiing was really the focus of our life in the wintertime. I think if I look back, though, it's probably my mother who shaped uh, my personality more than my father, because she was, um, and still is, really quite amazing. She's a very matter-of-fact type of a person who isn't afraid of anything. She's got tremendous courage. She's had a handicap all her life, which I didn't even notice until after somebody pointed it out to me. When I was going to school, she has an arm that's uh, paralyzed uh, from here down and I mean we really did not notice that and she, it never stopped her from doing anything she skied she raised six children and um, she still skis when you travel with a team the team becomes your family and I mean I was very fortunate the family that I had and where I grew up um, whenever I went back home which to some years was you know two and three months between um, getting home but whenever I went back home uh, my sisters and brothers used to sort of say, okay, you've been away for three months, it's your turn to do the dishes, you know. And there was no, there was a lot of uh, give and take in our family. But I knew they were very, very interested. For example, in 1967, when, when I really inside me thought that I had no hope to win the World Cup, my father phoned me and said, Nancy, it's mathematically, it's still possible. If you do this and this, and if they don't do this and this, and... And week by week, he followed it and he figured out really what I had to do to win. And I, I was trying to not think about it too much because I, if I thought if I thought about it too much, I would, um, I would get too uptight and, and blow everything. But I have to admit that it was really nice when he would call and say, you can still do it. It's still possible. And that kept me going. And in, in the end, I won the World Cup in the very last race of the year. And, and it was on Easter Sunday. and. I was in the finish area at the, the race at um, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and the loudspeaker said, Nancy Green, please go to the um, judges stand. I went over there and they said, there's a phone call for you. And I walked in and it was my parents phoning from Rossland, and they had been in church on Easter Sunday, and had come out of the church and were driving home and heard that I had won the World Cup. Do you think they've been saying a couple of prayers <laughs> for you while they were there? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so you're really happy with your life today? I can't think of anything I'd like to change. I really can't. So when I look back, uh, sometimes I think it's almost uh, been magic, and I keep waiting for something bad to happen. You know, we've had, I guess when you grow up, you always have sadnesses happening in your life, and we've lost a few people that were very close to us, and, and um, there's been sad times as well as happy times. But on the whole, we've, uh, we've had a good life, and we, we look forward to e even doing more things and... You know, this is a young country, and there's so much to do here. There's so much opportunity. If you look around, uh, it's nice to be in British Columbia right now. It's nice to be seeing this part of Canada starting to mature and really become the, the focus for Canada reaching towards the Asia-Pacific area. That's important. It's, an, it's a nice time to be part of it all. For the National Albine Championships, the winner from Canada, Nancy Green. During the late 60s, Howie Vickers was the dynamic lead singer of Vancouver's first high-profile band, The Collectors. Together with Bill Henderson, Glenn Miller, Ross Turney, and Claire Lawrence, they rose rapidly to fame, especially on the West Coast. The Collectors eventually became Chilliwack who had their own years of glory. Howie Vickers is now working at Griffith Gibson Ramsey Productions, but in the beginning, he was a member of the classics on the Let's Go show. Look out a baby, what do you see, what do you see, looking at a baby. 
we all came out of uh, out of the club scene. Well, actually, the, the previous to that, we were the classics doing Let's Go Show, etc. And I, 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 not so fast. Okay. The classics. Sorry. Was it a good time being on the Let's Go Show and backing up all of those? Oh, yeah. Tell me about the people that you worked with. Oh, gee whiz. I, I'll tell you, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind about Let's Go, uh, there's all sorts of things come to mind. It, and it was fun, yeah. yeah. There was, it was with yourself, with Freddie Latimer, Red Robinson, all, all, all sorts of folks. Plus all the musical people in Northcott, Terry, Terry Jacks, uh, Susan Jack, yeah. then Susan Pesklovitz, I guess. But uh, the, the, the first flash I had when you talked about, uh, when you talked about the Let's Go show was at one point, uh, Ken Gibson had me hosting the show this uh, uh, I don't know what possessed him or what possessed me to say yes but at, at any point I did that and uh, the first thing I remember having to do was interviewing Stevie Wonder <laughs> <laughs> well interview I never interviewed anybody before period so that was that was my that was my first memory ladies and gentlemen it's with great pleasure we welcome to our show Mr. Stevie Wonder good to see you again Steve. how you doing Great. One of our Vancouver nightclubs, Izzy's, has a policy of bringing in Motown performers, and it's thanks to Izzy that we have Steve on the show today. Glad you can make it, Steve. Oh, it's a groove being here. We were fortunate enough to be, as you see, the Let's Go show, and then through that, once we formed the collectors, we got a lot of support from CBC, and they, they, we did a lot of stuff on CBC uh, as the collectors. And they, uh, some of the early stuff that, that, that the Lydia Purple sequence might be a part of was when we, uh, we had a lot of demos, and these were basically... Uh, uh, video shot to 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 our er, some of our early music a lot of which i think probably never actually got onto onto album It was around, around 1970, I suppose, that, and uh, we mentioned Grass and Wild Strawberries was one of the last things I did. So that was basically my last involvement uh, as the collectors. They went on to become Chilliwack, as you know, and uh, around 70. So I, I became involved with uh, a studio in town called Studio 3 at the time. Yeah. And it was sort of around that time that I got involved in uh, more... Uh, Full time into the jingle thing, which is what I'm presently into with uh, Brian Griffiths, Brian Gibson, Miles Ramsey, Griffiths, Gibson, Ramsey. Uh, in addition to that, around that time, I ended up um, meeting, well, I'd known Jim McGillivray for years, but we ended up forming what, what was the original Wild Root band, which became Wild Root Orchestra and yeah. still is Wild Root Orchestra. So through about 71 or so, up to 76 we were we were a five-piece band i was the lead singer with with wilder and uh around 76 i basically uh finished with live you know on a steady basis live performances and uh and i've stayed in the music business but more from the business end of it in in, in uh, commercial production yeah i'm involved more in in producing and writing uh so behind behind the microphone as it were in, rather than in front of it now so if you had to do it all over again I wouldn't change anything in my life. I don't think, you know, it's 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 turned. It, it, things are going real well. Okay. They've never been better, and uh, I'm having a good time. I got a great family and great friends, and this is what better place to live. By the way, these days, Nancy and her husband Al are owner operators of Nancy Green Lodge at Whistler Mountain. And Howie co-wrote our theme song with another Let's Go performer, Terry Pruitt. Sure. Our final guest, Miles Ramsey, is known to Canadians today as that guy in the Chevron ads. He looks like your next-door neighbor, but behind that chipmunk smile lies a whole other story. Miles arrived from the States on a visit in 65 and soon landed himself a job singing on CBC television. He could be spotted as one of the singers on the teen series Let's Go, in the all-male cast of Chorus Gentlemen, and as one of the numerality singers on programs such as Up, Up, and Away and Show of the Week. For almost 20 years now, he's been writing, singing, arranging, producing, and talking in radio and television ads as a partner in one of Canada's biggest and best music jingle houses, Griffith Gibson Ramsey Productions of Vancouver. I came up here with the intention of stopping off, literally, and instead began to work fairly regularly and fairly frequently, and uh, got a job at the CBC singing backgrounds on a rock and roll show called uh, the 
Let's go, ship. See, 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 rider. I see what you've done. We did a show uh, in the late 60s under the name of uh, the New Morality Singers. Yeah. Well, Ken had worked out this choreography for us that was really stunning, okay? <laughs> that where, I've forgotten who it was, Griff and, and Hoot or somebody were sitting on stools here. And they were kind of singing the little chorus, right? And the rest of us were supposed to pop up behind them at the chorus, right? They sang the verse, and then we popped up. So we had been in position, and he zoomed in with the camera, and then we were supposed to crawl on our hands and knees and pop up. And <clears throat> the, the cameraman pulled out too quickly, and there are five adults crawling on their hands and knees through <laughs> television land. As with most outtakes, that film was thrown away. This is the original, of course, of Happy Together. The best thing about this is that the lady he's sitting next to is Coraline, and they've been married for 20 years now. I look back now and think, you know, I'm 46 years old. I, I couldn't be a L.A. Dodger anymore. I'm too old, you know? Yeah. And I couldn't be a, a, a singer bursting on the scene. I'm too old for that now. And uh, I wish I'd given a little harder push when I had the opportunity. There was an unfortunate period where Stephen, of course, who did all of the Chevron spots for years and years and years, passed away, and you became Mr. Chevron. Mm hmm did you, had you any idea that it was going to grow to the... No, I figured, I figured that I was a stopgap. I was a fill-in for Steve. A couple of things mitigated in my favor. One, uh, he and I <clears throat> have a similar kind of look and a similar kind of attitude. And I'm here. Yeah. So it wasn't a big hassle for them to get somebody else to come in. The thing that you both of you have, and I know you both, is that you are every man. Well... Alvin Wasserman, the, the creator director of the agency, was quoted in a magazine story last summer as, uh, let me get it right, he said, uh, we, we chose Miles because we didn't want a hunk. And I thought, boy, Alvin, I'm, I'm going to put that on my tombstone. I wasn't a hunk. <laughs> Thanks, Miles. As you can see, this is a show about people and memories.